Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar with Hammer Metals Limited. My name is Adam Mithke from Discovery Capital Partners, and I'm pleased to host today's session. Today, we'll be speaking with Daniel Thomas, who is the Managing Director for Hammer Metals. Dan, Daniel, or Dan, as he is better known, joined the company in October 2019 and has been instrumental in delivering the revised strategy as a dual focused exploration company. Hammer's portfolio comprises two highly prospective exploration projects hosted in two of Australia's world-class mineral belts, the Andal Gold Belt of Western Australia and uh, the Mount Isa province of Queensland. Both assets are located in hot parts of the world from a mineral exploration perspective that are underexplored and Hammer has delivered results that demonstrate major potential to date. They're located close to major operating mines, which is a major competitive, competitive advantage. Dan comes with an impressive and relevant background and is surrounded by a team with a tremendous track record in making world-class discoveries, which he'll talk through during his presentation. Dan was formerly the principal of business development at Sampire Resources uh, and has a background that spans world-class mining companies, including Mitsui, West Farmers, and several other mining companies. Before I hand over, I wanted to briefly touch on three key reasons that Discovery Capital has a high level of conviction around the potential for Hammer Metals. Firstly, we believe Hammer's exploration portfolio across both jurisdictions has the potential to host significant discoveries. Looking around the head frame of existing mines is a tremendous place to start when you're looking for a new mine. Secondly, Hammer is run by a team with a proven track record in exploration success, having been accredited with discoveries including the 5.8 million ounce Griot gold discovery by Gold Road Resources. Finally, Hammer has a lot of value upside. Benchmarking Hammer against its peer group demonstrates this, whether you benchmark it against gold or copper base metals uh, and base metals peers. Um, and it's got a lot of leverage to any discoveries they make in, a, in either property. So with that, I'll pass on to Dan to provide the overview and we'll follow that with questions. If you do have any questions, just please raise your hand using the icon at the bottom of your screen. During the presentation is fine and we can address these at the end of the presentation. We'll get through as many as we can. So with that, I'll hand over to you, Dan. Thank you, Adam. Thanks to everyone for dialing in today. I really appreciate your time um, and really appreciate you taking interest in the Hammer Metal story. Um, I'll share my screen with you and technology willing, um, I'll get that up in front of us and I hope, um, Adam, if you can just confirm that that's up at the moment. Confirm, Dan, that's good. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so I gave this presentation last week at the RIU Resurgence Conference in Perth. Um, I'm hoping that this is a little bit more conversational in nature and I'm sure that as uh, investors or potential investors in the company, you already have a sense of familiarity with what we're doing. So hopefully this can provide you a little bit more background and insight into what the company is doing and what we're thinking. I think the key for us at the moment is our West Australian gold exploration portfolio and what we're doing there. And that's probably the area where we're spending the most, uh, most amount of our shareholder funds at the moment. Um, as I touched on last week in the thematic, uh, what better time to be exploring for gold um, I think as the world uh, grapples with uh, economic uncertainty, um, printing of money, I think uh, being exposed to the gold market is, uh, is incredibly fortuitous at the moment for the company. I think equally as we look for company, look for countries to um, stimulate their economies um, and look to um, build infrastructure and the like, I think we stand to prosper from having a strong portfolio of base metal uh, exploration assets and to find jork resources in Queensland. Uh, so in summary, I think uh, we've got some great exposure to some great commodities, but I think equally important as that is having uh, projects in good jurisdictions, um, in, in places where we're well renowned for gold and copper mineralisation, and also having a team capable of making discoveries in those regions. So they're the three key elements, I think, behind Hammer and what we've been doing. Uh, in terms of in terms of the team, um, you know the team, and I think everyone by now probably got the alerts on the ASX announcement. We just put out an announcement that um, we've managed, uh, we've received elections to convert a further 40 million of the outstanding options. Um, so they've just brought in an additional 1.2 million dollars in funding into the company. Uh, those options expire in eight days. Uh, I know they've created a little bit of an overhang in the stock and and how we've been trading. 
Um, but I think the key point out of all of that is um, there's now uh, a, a strong balance sheet, strong funding behind us to complete our exploration activities and give us a solid pipeline uh, to, to explore our properties aggressively and look to, to make a discovery in those regions. Uh, so post today, I think there's 80 million of the options outstanding. Um, I think you know, we'll see a number of those converted as well, and I think it will put us in, in good stead with a, with a cash balance in excess of uh, $5 million at the end of the quarter. But um, I've spoken a lot about the team and a lot, a, lot of the, a lot of the key good things behind what we're doing. I think as a team, uh, we've got a, a strong technical background. Mark, Ziggy and Russell have many years of experience, both in Mount Isa and the Gold Provinces here in Western Australia. I think David Church, who's a recent addition to the board, and myself have a strong commercial and corporate background. I think the mix of those two elements uh, is, is a good founding for the company. Um, and in terms of support for the company, uh, I've made a, made a bit of a note about it before, but Ziggy and Russell's contribution and new equity into the company this year is in excess of $750,000. I think that's a really strong message for our investors is we've got directors who are prepared to back our projects and our concepts and I uh, believe there's inherent in value in what we have. Uh, I know everyone's time is precious, so I'll keep moving along. Um, there we are. So in the Yandel province, the, the premise of our, our initial uh, tenure here was the three properties, North Aurelia, I hope you can see my mouse, Bronzewing South, and also down at Ken's Bore. Over the 12 months, what we've done is we've looked to add low-cost um, low cost properties to this portfolio in the Yandel Belt. One of the key premises for us has been to add tenure that has exploration targets on it. I think as we've shown in our in our North Aurelia exploration today, the initial pass exploration that was done through the Yandel Belt in the 1990s, uh, mid-1990s to late 1990s, uh, really scratched the surface in terms of its potential. So I think it's a great place to be exploring. Most of the belt's tied up by one predominant player in the area. Um, I see ourselves as being a key player in this area moving forward. And where it makes sense and where we have exploration projects, we'll look to add more in this, in this region. In terms of the projects, I'll skip straight on to uh, our project at North Aurelia. And North Aurelia, I like pointing out this, uh, this graphic on the right-hand side here. Uh, in an ordinary course, all of the black dots of the exploration that was done through here in the 1990s. Um, again, coming in fresh to the story, I looked at it and went, it's, it's semi-interesting, but it looks like this area has been worked over pretty solidly. Um, when you dig into the data and you have a look, the average hole depth here is 29 metres. Um, so all of the black dots of the old exploration that's been done, we've come in now, we've done three air core programs here. And I think what we're defining here at target one is looking really, really interesting. Um, and I think the other areas, we've really only scratched the surface in terms of its potential. And in particular, down at target four, we drilled on this sort of western edge out here at target four. We didn't really get the results that we're hoping to see. Um, a couple of the holes that we drilled on the eastern side of what we had been drilling, tagged some interesting zones of sulfides. Um, correlating that to what we see down to the south that you really pits really opens up the potential for the area to the outside of where we've currently drilled. So sort of up in this corridor following the magnetic trends up, I really think that this area is lightly done. Uh, target three was an area where we had some geochemical anomalies. Um, and again, we'd sort of put that on the back burner a little bit. I think our soil survey that we've just done shown a very large soil anomaly all the way over, all, all the way over target three has also extended it to the south and also to the north a little bit. So I think there's some follow-up work to be done here. Um, similarly, again, between targets uh, two over here and target three, there's another area of soil anomalies in there. And again, we've extended the target area up at target one to the north with, again, an additional soil anomaly there. Um, but I think the key of what we're doing here is over the next three or four months, we're going to be doing some reverse circulation drilling in at target one, and I think it, it makes for a pretty good, pretty good target to be drilling. In terms of target one, what we've got here in terms of footprint is two kilometres now of gold mineralisation uh, extending from north to south. And I think what we see in terms of the overall footprint compares um, in a similar manner to what's down at the Aurelia deposit. So if you put the Aurelia, Lotus and Coburn complex up here, it stretches to an area just, just north of two kilometres. And so people ask me, what's the target size? What are we looking for at North Aurelia? Um, look, I think the upside here is that you could have something that looks similar to those Aurelia, um, Lotus and Coburn deposits. I think on the downside, what, what's the lowest number that we'd be looking for? I think some of these areas where we see some stacked mineralisation, hanging some of these areas together with RC drilling and finding a target of 250 to 300,000 ounces of gold 
Um, maybe at multiple places along this trend, I think is the lower end of what we're looking for. And I think what would make a real difference is the valuation of the company. So I think over a two kilometre trend, when you've got some of these gold intercepts here, I think the potential to deliver on that lower end scale is certainly there. And I think when you have a look at the, um, when you have a look at the drilling and the air core drilling that we've done to date here, it really doesn't look dissimilar to the top 80 metres of what you'd see above those Aurelia pits. So that is a lot of um, gold depletion zones, some areas that look quite prospective. So the four metres at five, four at a higher number that you can see down at Aurelia. Um, I think there's some, some real interest that what lies into the deeper fresh rock here. So drilling the RC rig rocks up in about two weeks. So we'll be looking to drill some deeper holes into the fresh rock, see what exists down underneath this uh, weathered material here. About 2,000 metres spread over roughly 21 holes, I think, is the current plan. There's a few additional holes planned. Whether or not we get to them will depend upon early results in the program. Um, again, we'll be picking out areas that look more prospective along this trend. So the northern northern area here where we've got three parallel trends of mineralisation is an obvious target. Um, some of the areas where we've got some of the better grades, um, I think, are also targets. So um, we'll be testing sections along that two-kilometre trend. In terms of an overall timeline, um, we're, we're hoping to get results uh, out from that program sort of towards the end of the year, sort of start of November might be when those results start coming through. Um, and I guess combined with some of the work at Bronzewing South, probably got a pretty full program up until Christmas. One of the things I like to point out is the original discovery hole at Bronzewing South, um, again, fairly similar in nature in terms of its uh, tenor and grade. Um, and its depth, so seeing that weathering profile through the original bronze wing mine discovery, four metres at 1.8 grams per tonne from 48 metres down hole, I think compares quite favourably to what we've seen at North Aurelia. Bronzewing South, uh, changing gears a little bit, Bronzewing South is a project that we had just drilled when I joined the company in October last year. Um, we drilled 2,800 metres over 14 holes. I think um, we all know the, the history of this tenure and that it was subject to a long, long legal dispute and has had limited exploration done historically. Uh, the diagram on the right here shows the areas of air core anomalism that were depicted through, through this tenement. Um, and as I said, um, back in 2003, Newmont uh, managed to complete about 10 deeper diamond or RC holes into the area. Combined with our 14 from last year, there's only 24 deeper holes here. Um, I'll show you what that looks like. The best result we got was from down in the south down here, hole number six, 10 metres at two grams per tonne from 130 metres down hole. It was a result that was, was I thought was pretty good and quite interesting for our first program here at Bronson South. Um, at the time, the budget was pretty tight. Um, it was a reasonably deep result for two grams per tonne and didn't really give us a lot of direction as to where we should be drilling. What we drilled was what we thought was the heart of a large gravity feature down here to the south. So the interpretation is a gravity low representing uh, an area of uh, alteration, potentially carbonate quartz veining associated with gold mineralisation. Um, and, and we're really scratching our head until this year. We came in and we did some further work here. Um, on the next slide, what I like to show here is that there are the, the 24 holes that were drilled into the property um, between Newmont and ourselves, all focused either on the, I guess, the uh, property boundary up here or on the eastern shear zone. You can see each of those 24 holes. Very little drilling done over this central corridor um, and a little bit down at this target area down to the south. When we did that detailed gravity survey, what we actually found is rather than drilling into the heart of one big gravity low, we actually drilled in between two discrete gravity lows. Um, so we applied for some state government funding earlier this year. Um, we were awarded $150,000 in um, co-funding to drill these two targets at Bronzewing South. We'll drill them uh, at the conclusion of the RC program. Um, so I'd imagine the RC program will take about a, a month to complete at Kensbore and also target one. We'll then come and drill a pre-collar on these holes and we'll drill a deeper diamond hole to, uh, to test the system. Those holes will go down to 600 metres each um, and I expect um, we should see some, some interesting rocks. The other area that I think is quite interesting, we talk about the gravity low and potentially representing alteration in quartz carbonate veining, um, is this area that sits in between the dolerite unit on the west and this eastern shear zone. It looks fairly similar in terms of the setting in between the eastern shear zone and the dolerite that you see at the bronze wing mine. And the gold mineralisation pretty much sits um, in between those two units. Uh, you can also see the gravity lows at Bronzewing um, where there could be some association with the gold 
Um, again, I think given this target hasn't been tested and this corridor hasn't been drilled at any particular depth, I think it offers um, some further potential. When you look at some a long section view through here, one of the things I draw everyone's attention to is just the uh, just the amount of drilling that we can see in the open file database on Bronzewing. You can see it's all quite substantial in terms of going uh, through pretty much the deposit. I think when you have a look uh, at our property, you can see just how little drilling has been done at any particular depth through here. Again, you can see the gravity features, um, an untested gravity feature here, and those two holes that we're going to be drilling later this year, sitting over two kilometres away from, from the Bronzewing mine. So I think this is a pretty big, uh, pretty big zone for us to have uh, a lot of work done in the future, and I think it presents some great targets for us. Last but not least, on the gold front, we'll be drilling Ken's Ball. We've spoken about it since we've acquired the property. Um, it's a really interesting area. Uh, lots of high-grade rock chips around. Uh, the rock chips that are recorded through the records here, and including ones that Hammer have taken, sit above a fault zone. Um, this fault zone regionally sits pretty close to an interpreted uh, ultramafic unit, which runs the length of really the Bronze Wing region, uh, terminates at Ken's Bore up against a granite unit. I'll have a look at that in a second. Um, we've got an untested EM conductor here that was um, found in the late 1990s, I think, by Independence. Um, sits up against the ultramafic unit right next to the fault zone. It's really easy, neat drill target for us to stick about 500 metres of reverse circulation drilling into. And I think it offers a great, great potential exploration uh, uh, hole. So we'll be looking to do that. This will be the first target that we're drilling the upcoming program. I think we'll do the holes at Kensmore first followed by the holes up at target one, um, and we will go from there. So I spoke very briefly then about this ultramafic unit that runs down the length of the property. So the magnetics pick it up fairly well here. You can see it runs down the length of the property, comes and terminates against this large granite feature down here. Um, our Ken's bore prospect is sitting right up here in, in amongst that contact. Um, I think it's a, it's a great exploration target. Um, as I said, target one, we've got the RC program upcoming uh, starting starting at the end of next week, hopefully, uh, followed by the, the Diamond program over here at Bronzewing South. There's work to be done at targets two, three, and four, and there's potential Air Corps program into early next year, um, as well as our other tenements within the Yandel belt up to the north. I think there's some work there for us to do next year. So I think it's a busy, busy program coming, shaping up at... Um, at Bronzewing, uh, three great targets that we'll be chasing, and, and I'm hopeful that one of them will give us something to um, really pursue quite hard early in the new year. Changing gears into Mount Isa, um, I don't think we should forget um, the, the Mount Isa portfolio, and I think the message here is we're equally as busy in Mount Isa with our, our field work as what we are at Bronzewing. Um, we're working really closely with our joint venture partner, Jogmec. Um, together, we've just released, obviously, the shadow results and the Toby results on face value. They may not be as appealing to our investors as they are to the, the joint venture partners, but we're quite encouraged by what we've seen there. Uh, so we are exploring for large-scale IOCG systems in the uh, in the Mount Isa region. Um, there's a lot going on. I think um, some of our portfolio there is, is forgotten about, in particular, our drop resources. I think the pick of those is at Kelman. Um, I think there's some uh, some value to be had there for our shareholders in the company, and I, I really believe that with an uptick in copper prices, there will be a renewed interest in what we're doing in the Mount Isa region. In terms of the joint venture and the shadow drilling, I think the key message here is we drilled 380 metres or 370 metres at, uh, at, at a fairly large prospect here. So when we look at the shadow prospect itself, it is a, it is a defined area about 400 metres in, in length and about 150 metres in width. Um, in terms of the overall trend, it's a very small area over four and a half. Small area, we're, we're exploring over a four and a half kilometre trend of increased magnetics sits right up against the hematite deposit. So when you're exploring for an iron oxide copper gold system to see a hematite uh, system along with uh, along with uh, copper in soils and also, I guess, with, um, with large magnetic targets sitting next to them, I think they're quite appealing. The thing that struck me most about this area is um, you're in a renowned copper belt. Um, you're sitting next to the iron oxide deposit. Uh, these copper rock chips are, are surface samples, so they haven't been uh, previously previously identified as a region containing high-grade copper and gold, gold up to 6 grams, copper up to 28%, and not a, not a drill hole going into, uh, into this particular target. When you have a look at, um, at what we drilled, we drilled pretty much across the entire length, sorry, the entire width of this target underneath the highest-grade rock chips. 
Um, so a couple of hundred metres of hole to get across. We didn't drill into the heart of the gravity target here. Uh, the, uh, I guess, thing that puzzled us most is not getting similar types of intersections or graders to what we've seen on, sample, uh, on surface here. I think when you have a look at it, um, the, the easy, easy dismissal is uh, it's just super gene um, mineralisation that you're observing on surface. I don't think it's a simple answer. Um, in fact, when you have a look at the uh, concentrations of elements through the drill hole, there's no real surface effect of copper mineralisation higher up in the hole compared to the bottom of the hole. Um, so we're still at a bit of a loss to explain exactly why we didn't pick up better mineralisation in the hole. What I will say, it's a very large system an eight kilometre uh, breccia diameter unit through the area. I think there's a lot of area for us to explore through here. Um, I'm really pleased that JogMEC also share that view and we've committed to doing a detailed soil sampling program all the way through the Mount Felt region. Um, there's a lot of work ongoing. There's a downhole EM survey, which has recently been completed. Um, I think all the data is currently being interpreted. Um, I think there's a lot of work to be done here in Mount Isa still and um, we're, we're keen to get after it. Uh, potentially more 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 um, more uh, of a question mark for me was what happened at Kelman and why didn't we intersect the EM plate? Um, the EM plate that we had at Kelman was was quite a strong anomaly, uh, strong regional V tem anomaly. We drilled uh, we drilled over budget here. We drilled probably a few more meters than we'd initially planned to drill, and we drilled those extra meters as a result of the core looking um, highly altered, looking quite interesting, very similar in nature to Kelman. We didn't see enough uh, mineralisation, enough pyrite or chalka pyrite or graphite in the hole to explain the EM conductor. I think this is a classic uh, opportunity for us to look at downhole EM and see uh, why we missed this, why we missed the target or if we missed the target. So I'm hopeful that we might see an off-hole conductor here or in-hole conductor and help us explain the, the anomaly that we have. Um, again, there's a lot more work to be done here. High-grade rock chips on surface, um, a lot of mineralisation through sitting in a very similar structural setting to Kalman. Um, I think there's more work to be done here by the joint venture and, uh, and, and we're, we're on that pathway at the moment. As well as those particular projects and, and uh, particular targets we're, we're pursuing, um, it's worth noting we did do a very big regional program with JogMEC earlier in the year. We did a lot of, um, a lot of gravity surveys, a lot of ground EM work. Um, there's a number of follow-up targets there that we're now reviewing on grounds. We're doing some mapping. We're doing further um, further soil sampling. I think there's a number of areas that will uh, will look interesting for the for the joint venture to pursue. Current plans are to get back and do a further drilling program. Um, there's a lot of work to go to work out exactly where we'll be drilling and what sort of program size that will be, and that'll be a decision for the joint venture to make in the coming months. In terms of our 100% property, um, that JogMEC joint venture only covers obviously um, about 15% of our portfolio in Queensland. So I think it's important to let our shareholders know that we do have uh, we do have a, a view to trying to keep progressing our 100% portfolio there and our other joint ventures. We think it's very important for the company um, to continue to advance these prospects. Uh, this year has been um, quite interesting. We've been quite innovative and have been um, really fortunate to have received two grants from the Queensland State Government to progress some of these projects. The first one was to complete a magneto telluric study and one of the more exciting results out of that was what we've seen at Kelman. So the Kelman deposit, 20 million tonnes at 1.8% copper equivalent. Um, this intersection is just a, a classic high-grade copper intersection that if we drilled that in today's market, on a, on a new project, I think um, everyone would be quite excited and quite interested in the story. And I think people should take a little bit of note of that particular intersection and what else might be around in our Mount Isa portfolio. That magneto telluric study did a great job. We can see just behind the Kelman wireframe here of picking up the, the um, uh, response from the Kelman deposit. It also picked up a number of nearby responses close to surface. Uh, so just here off to the west and out to the east, this uh, quite strong, uh, striking feature out here. Uh, the larger trend you can see down here is far too deep to be drill testing, um, but the exploration model is that this is a deep fluid source providing pathway um, up to these structures, or structures providing a pathway for these fluids up to surface and generating the high grades of mineralisation we've seen. In terms of the Kelman deposit, what next? I think these areas will make a corridor uh, of exploration targets um, quite attractive. I think there's some work to be done around putting together some exploration targets along these, um, what, what effectively now is a two-dimensional survey. 
I think um, putting together some soil surveys and samples around this area and delineating where, where to go with these particular targets uh, is the next step there, and I think it'll be something we look to do uh, in the coming year. I think also uh, the opportunity to really develop or bring this project along is reliant upon new exploration. So I think um, the Kalman deposit as it sits today, if you had a plan operating in the area, let's say within 20 kilometres, I think would be a, an economic proposition and I think would be producing profit. I think the prospect of paying back capital on a project for Kalman at the moment with uh, commodity prices where they are is probably a tougher proposition. Um, and whilst we could probably go down the pathway of spending millions of dollars completing a study, I'm not sure of the benefit that that would derive to shareholders. So at the moment, the, the brief here for Kelman really is to try and advance this project through nearby exploration. I think any success that we have within the joint venture, any success that anyone has in Queensland opens up the potential for this particular project. So in terms of what's next uh, for Mount Isa in 2020, um, it's obviously a lot more work within the joint venture and potential future drilling as part of that joint venture. Um, we've recently drilled that uh, the project up at Copany there. I'm hopeful that those results are imminent to be released. Um, it was a rare earth uh, copper target up at Copany, some great rare earth intersections in nearby holes, and we're drilling a high-grade uh, soil surface anomaly there. Again, that was another program um, funded by the Queensland Government through the CEI program, um, and I'm looking forward to being able to release those results in the coming, coming few days, hopefully. Um, but there's also work to be done all the way through the region. Um, there's a number of targets that we have through the area at uh, Kings and Charlotte from a gold perspective. Down around Tick Hill, there's work to be done, and I expect these will be the types of projects that will move on in the next 12 months. They'll likely to be lower lower um, cost activities, but I think provide us with an opportunity to continue to advance um, our programs and our portfolio in Queensland. There's a very brief summary slide, so I think a very busy end to the year with a lot of results, a lot of drilling results to come out from the Bronzewing region. I think Mount Isa, um, realistically, those results will probably take a little bit longer to come out from a drilling perspective. I think they'll be targets for Q1 next year in terms of news flow. Um, but I think it's a very solid pipeline of work that we've got planned over the next three months and then and then early into 2021. So I hope that's given everyone a bit more of a flavour as to the thinking behind what we're doing and how we're going about things. I know I've seen a few questions pop up as I've been talking, so I might pass back to Adam to, um, to uh, moderate those questions and, and to let people come along and ask them. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for the presentation and thank you, everybody, for joining We've got time for a few questions. Um, just while they're building up, maybe I'll just start with a few that have been emailed across, Dan. So just in terms of the plan for Bronzewing South, what do you envisage on the basis that the next phase uh, delivers the sorts of results that you're hoping? Yeah, so I think if we had some good intersections of target one, I think we'd very quickly move to try and define a, a resource there in Q1 next year. I think our current uh, cash position would allow us to, to pursue that pretty quickly and get after it without having to think about the market. And um, I think that that's the, a likely path forward with some good results out of either Target 1 or Kensbor or Bronzewing South. I think, um, I think we've got that opportunity in front of us. I know the flip side of that question is, well, what next if those results aren't fantastic? Um, I think there's a number of solid targets that I outlined uh, through that discussion there that present great opportunity to move forward. I think the key message that I can give shareholders is it's a it's, a, it's an area that hasn't been explored well in the past, and I think that offers us a great opportunity. And I think the competitive landscape outside of um, our large neighbour there, um, I, I think, is, is a real opportunity and real advantage for what we've got in terms of, uh, in terms of our portfolio and the Andal Belt. Great. And just a reminder, if anyone does have a question, you can just hit the raise hand uh, icon and uh, those questions will pop up and we can take those as well. Another question, Dan, just with the current um, progress of exploration underway in broader Western Australia, how are you guys dealing with turnaround times with respect to assays at the labs and being able to make announcements? Yeah, so our last experience on Aircore was fantastic. Um, we had a really good turnaround from the laboratory and I'd love to give the laboratory a plug, but I don't want to let everyone know where we get our good turnaround times from. Um, I am very cautious, though, that in the current environment, there is a lot of people out there doing a lot of work. So sourcing a rig for us this time was quite difficult. 
um, and I am conscious that turnaround times might blow out. Um, I think as everyone saw in our recent delays around Queensland, um, people were expecting the results. I probably made promises in terms of a turnaround time there that couldn't be met. Uh, the laboratory had some unforeseen um, circumstances. They actually moved location, really struggled with turnaround times. In a typical course, I'd expect results back within three weeks of us submitting them to the laboratory. That's a three-week timetable to enable the lab to complete the work, for us to complete all of our quality and checks and release, I guess, what is a, a meaningful batch of information. So we're looking at a, at a news flow perspective starting during at the end of uh, September, start of October, I would imagine the first set of results hitting market towards the end of October, early November. And um, just with respect to all your various targets across the portfolio in WA and in Queensland, um, how are you ranking those targets with respect to earlier stage more conceptual targets versus some of the more brownfields targets? Yeah, it's a good question. I think um, I think the, the easy answer there is the best place to be looking is around some of those brownfield targets. I think I explained through, through the discussion then that I think doing um, studies on some of our jork deposits there at the moment is a little premature and doesn't create the value we're looking for. I think the real value uplift uh, for Hammer and where we sit today is to have exploration results um, in close proximity to that. So looking nearby Kelman, uh, I think it's a great opportunity. Uh, in Western Australia, I think looking close to Bronze Wing is a great opportunity, but um, we need to balance that with generating new targets and new ideas as well. And I think some of our portfolio in Western Australia uh, hasn't seen a drill rig on it ever, and there's some soil anomalies to follow up. So for instance, Sam Well up to the north in the Andal Belt, I think it's an obvious area for us to start targeting next year. I think there's a little bit of ground truthing to be done there. We have visited the area before. We have seen it. We like the setting. Um, but just validating some of that historical data from those soil results will be important before we start thinking about getting a drill rig up there and targeting. And Dan, um, another question. In terms of all the various targets that you have, what target are you personally most excited about? I think target one at the moment is the closest near-term potential uh, game changer for Hammer. I think the goal that we've seen there today over such a long trend, I think is quite promising. Um, and I think that's obviously one of the targets we're drilling in the near term. Um, I think that could really change the dynamic for us and our position in the Yandel. Um, equally, I am a copper and gold guy, so I really like the work that we're doing in Mount Isa. I like some of our targets there. Um, I think we're ripe in that central corridor there to make a sizable discovery. If you have a look at our land position there, we're we're positioned along two major fault structures that run up through there. If you have a look at Cannington or have a look at Mount Isa and all of the discoveries in the Mount Isa region, they have been along those major regional fault structures and settings. Um, I think we've got the two there that haven't been explored particularly well. Um, historically, I think it's a real opportunity to get after a large scale copper discovery in that region. Um, and I think the the reluctance for people to get involved in there historically has been that all of the geology outcrops. Um, so my question on that and, and the easy answer on that one is if it all outcrops and it's all easy to be found, how come we're drilling shadow um, that's got some fantastic surface geochemistry yet hasn't actually ever had a drill hole in it from a, from a base metals perspective. So I think there's some real potential there that people have missed historically and I think that offers us um, a great, great future. And next we'll field a, a question from uh, Ivan. Um, he's asked, does the Hammer team believe Ken's bore has pro prospectivity for nickel? Uh, yeah, short answer is yes, it does have prospectivity for nickel. Um, I'm quite happy to make a discovery um, in any, um, any commodity that is possible. Um, I don't like, I don't love talking about nickel potential and I don't want to confuse the story, which is we are a a gold and copper explorer. In saying that, um, I think you're right. I think uh, we've seen in the region in the Andal, Toro have, a, have an interesting nickel intersection. I think if you trace that ultramafic unit up through the belt, I think it would run up towards uh, Toro's uh, current target up there. Uh, obviously, uh, an EM conductor and sits underneath a, an, an iron stone unit on surface, um, ultramafic through the region. I, I think it is, it is partly a nickel target, but associated with that fault zone and the gold on surface. Um, I'll take both. Let's take a nickel and gold discovery at Ken's Bore. I'd be happy with that. Okay. Thanks, Dan.
Um, post the exercise of option, post the um, current treasury, what does Hammond's cash position look like um, tomorrow? Uh, if I gave a best guess, it's September 30, and I'm not sure I'm supposed to under ASX guidelines, but I would imagine that um, a number of uh, $5 million would be a conservative view on where we'll sit from a cash balance perspective um, at September 30. Great. I'm going to uh, just click to a question here. Um, I just want to ask, um, obviously you've got plenty of money in the tin now with the options coming in, um, and is there scope if you get good RC results from any of this program to extend this program, if the calls are good or you see any um, sniffs of anything you like? I would imagine um, the current budget for the two programs combined would be in the region of about three quarters of a million dollars. That's to do both the RC and diamond drilling programs. So the Treasury certainly allows it. Um, I think the um, ordering of those particular programs, uh, Ken's ball being first, um, but two fairly quick targets to drill, two quick holes there, um, I think lends itself to um, a pro program that would allow us to drill the holes at, um, at target one, get the results back while that program finishes from the early stages. Um, obviously, there's some pre-collars to be done at Bronzewing South. I think the option to keep the rig on site there um, will be there. Um, but I think it would take some pretty good early results from the first couple of holes to enable that to happen. I think a more likely scenario is we would um, get the majority of those results in and bring the rig back um, before Christmas to really crack after one of those, um, one of those areas of interest. Beautiful. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, and Dan, um, are you planning on doing any exploration on the recently acquired ground in WA? Uh, the short answer is it won't be this year. Uh, I think it will be next year before we get up there. Um, we're still waiting on those uh, tenement transfers to be effectively completed. Um, a couple of our properties there are also in the application status rather than uh, they haven't moved to grant status yet. Um, so I would imagine there'll be targets that we start to review early next year. I think the first port of call would be to go and revisit some of the soil sampling done up at Sam's Well. There's a, there's a striking gravity feature through the region that runs from Jundee all the way down through Ramon um, into the Samwell ground. I think that's a, a really interesting feature. Having a, a, a soil anomaly there already, I think, is, um, is a good start. I think we'd like to add a bit more. But I think the short answer, yes, we'll get after it next year. I think it's a target for Q1, Q2 next year. Perfect, Dan. And, and just one final question here is, given your business development background, are there other opportunistic targets you might be looking for um, to further bolster Hammer's portfolio moving forward? Yeah, short answer is I'm, ha I'm comfortable where the, where the portfolio sits today, um, but I, do, I have seen a lot of opportunities over the five years I worked at Sandfire with projects that make a big difference. I think the key point now is um, that pool is got dramatically smaller with the result of uh, an impact of COVID and the ability for companies to travel. So I think what we're seeing is a highly competitive land space in a, uh, a competitive landscape in Australia for, for transactions and assets that can make a real difference. I've always got an eye out for those opportunities um, and I'd never say that we wouldn't do one of them, but I think we've got plenty of targets in front of us at the moment. Um, that it would take a pretty exceptional opportunity for us. It would have to be within the areas we're already operating and make sense, um, or it would have to be, as I said, a, a tremendous opportunity. Um, but I've always got an open mind. Um, I've got a view to what can add value for a company. I, I'd like to think that uh, it was an area of difference uh, through my career. So if there was an opportunity to do so for Hammer, I would certainly be keen um, to, to pursue that. Um, as I said, I think it would need to make a lot of sense for the company to do it. Um, we just had another question come through, Dan. No, it's a good one. Um, have you had any discussion with Northern Star? Uh, operationally, we're very, very adjacent to Northern Star and what's happening there. Um, they've obviously um, been on the acquisition trail over the past couple of years. And I would imagine that any discussions at the moment would be quite premature. Um, we're very comfortable in pursuing um, our properties and our projects in our own right at the moment and looking to add ounces. I think um, my read on the, the Bronzewing situation and the Bronzewing mill is that their resources in the immediate vicinity are probably two to 300,000 ounces short of being able to economically get the Bronzewing mill back up and, and running uh, with, a, I guess, a five-year business plan. 
And I see us being able to discover those ounces and eventually feed into that mill in one form or another as being, a, being an end strategy for us. I think it's also important that we have other end strategies and it's worth noting that we're not far from Darlow, we're not far from, um, from, our, from Bellevue. I think there's a number of different avenues for us to commercialise any discovery we make in the region. Um, and I think, as I said, we're, we're getting on with the exploration story at the moment and not necessarily um, trying to engage down that pathway. Fantastic. Well, that's the end of the question list that I have, and uh, it appears there's no further questions. So uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us for today's webinar, and, and thank you, Dan, for that update uh, from Hammer Metals.